Look with me in verse 14. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gift that you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Jesus Christ to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Summer officially began on Friday, and the July 4th holiday is next week, and then it's summer vacation season, and just before everybody scatters to the four winds, I want to take a few minutes and I want to give you a progress report on two very important projects that we're working on right now. The first project I want to talk about is our satellite campus at the Majestic Theater in downtown Stamford. In your bulletin, there is a response card, and there's a picture of the Majestic Theater at the top. Would you take a moment, and would you just fish that out of your bulletin and take a look at it with me? We have a need for some helping hands in Stanford this summer. Here at our Greenwich campus, we change things up during July and August, and some of our ministry teams actually get a, a rest that lasts 10 weeks over the summer months. Other of our ministry teams here are large enough that we can cover for each other's vacations without too much difficulty, but there's no rest for the weary up at our Stanford satellite. And I would love for us to put our heads together this morning and conspire to do something about that. Pastor Derek Sanchez has been leading our Stanford Satellite Campus for the last year. He's also been working full-time, and he's been a seminary student part-time. And after a year of yeoman's service to us, Pastor Derek is going to be stepping back so that he can concentrate on his family this summer. So today, I want to ask if you would be willing to go up to Stanford just one Sunday morning over the next 10 weeks to help out. Men, we especially have a need for uh, some guys who are willing to sign up one Sunday morning to drive the van that is loaded with all the equipment from this campus up to Stanford to help unload everything and then to reload it again at the end of the service and drive it back here. It would take up about four and a half hours of your time just one Sunday morning. Women and men, we would like to ask if you'd consider helping out just one week with children's ministries. You can be a helper, an assistant. You could help out uh, being an usher, being a greeter, serving coffee and bagels. If you serve coffee and bagels up there, you actually get to eat coffee and bagels. So we don't have coffee and bagels here. That's a better, it's a better deal up in Stanford. Maybe you've come back home to the Greenwich campus from Stanford. And uh, it would be great if you would consider going up there just one Sunday morning and helping out. I know it would be such an encouragement. And this is what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you to do something bold. Now, the backsliders at 8.30 service, when I asked them to do this, just sat there looking at me. So, But I know that you're more spiritual than the 11.30 service. So uh, I, I, are we live streaming? Uh, so I know you'll help me out. I want you to take a pen, seriously. And I want you to take a look at that. And I want you to look at the dates. We have the next 10 weeks we have listed there in July and in August. Um, you already know the dates that you're going to be away on vacation. Would you consider helping out one Sunday morning in Stanford? Would you fill your name out and give us your email address, give us your cell phone number, um, indicate the date that you might be able to serve, and then would you indicate how you might be able to serve? Driving the van, 
helping to load and unload. Uh, if you know sound and lights, maybe you could relieve the team one Sunday morning. Nursery helper, um, usher, uh, greeter, it takes no training, zero training to hand out bulletins. You can just smile and do that. You can figure it out. I know, you're smart people. Uh, hand out bagels or coffee. Would you take a moment and would you fill that out right now? And in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to pass those towards the center aisle. And uh, the ushers are going to come by to receive them from you. This is a picture of Sophie and Jeremy. Two years ago, Sophie moved to Stamford, Connecticut from France to work for Swiss Bank. And Sophie wasn't a believer, but somehow she found her way into our Stamford Satellite Campus and she asked Jesus Christ into her heart. She started dating Jeremy and she invited Jeremy to come to our Stanford campus with her. And although Jeremy was raised in the church when he was in high school and college, he wandered away in his early 20s, he walked away. But when he came to the Stanford campus, he met Jesus in a powerful new way. Just after Jeremy asked Jesus into his heart, he was transferred on business to St. Louis. And then Sophie received a transfer notice as well. But before she left, we scheduled a water baptism. And she called Jeremy and she said, I'm getting baptized. And when he heard that his home church was having a water baptism, he got on a plane and he flew from St. Louis all the way to New York just to get baptized. And this is a picture of Jeremy and Sophie getting baptized just a few weeks ago at the Boys and Girls Club in Greenwich. Beloved, I want to tell you that that is precisely why we planted this Stanford campus, to reach young men and women like Sophie and Jeremy. You know, we have a group of homeless people who come in off the street every Sunday morning, and we share the love of Jesus with them just by giving them a cup of cold water, a glass of orange juice, a cup of coffee, a, a bagel, and some of them come and they stay for the service. We have college students who are out all night partying on the streets of downtown Stanford, and they wait for the doors to open up to the Majestic Theater so they can come in and get something to eat, and sometimes they stay for some soul food as well. You never know what's going to happen up at the Stanford Satellite. And so uh, I'm asking you to do that. If you filled out those cards, would you just pass them right down to the center aisle right now? And I'm going to ask the ushers if they would come and just collect those from you. The office will give you an email to confirm that they've received uh, your slip, and then we'll call you and we'll set it up with you. And I just want to say thank you to all of you. Come on, can we give everybody a big hand this morning for just volunteering and just helping out? <clears throat> God bless you. If you're still filling that out, you can get it to the office at the end. The second progress report that I want to bring you this morning is about our phase two building project. Maybe you've recently become part of our Harvest Time family and you've seen the pictures of a new building out on the, the wall. You've heard me talk about phase two. You've heard me talk about Accelerate 52 and it's all kind of code to you. If you're new to our church family, I want to take a moment and bring you up to speed, and I want to give everyone a progress report on our new building. I know we have some visitors today, and I want to thank you for just being patient while we share a little bit about our history, uh, a little bit of family business, and I believe before we're finished, you're going to hear a word of encouragement from the Word of God this morning. I can completely relate to the affection that Paul had for the Philippian church because that's how I feel about Harvest Time Church. Paul's letter to the Philippians is the most intimate of all of his letters in the New Testament. No one supported Paul's ministry like the believers in Philippi. And that's ironic because more than any of Paul's other churches, the Philippians struggled under terrible financial pressure. Because of their faith in Jesus Christ, the Christians in Philippi were under extreme economic sanctions. The unbelievers cut them out of business. They ostracized them from society. Unbelievers wouldn't patronize Christian businesses. They wouldn't buy or sell to Christians at fair prices. They wouldn't hire them. The IRS put them on a blacklist and started systematically going, oh, I'm sorry, that's, uh, that's the United States of America, that's not Philippi. 
things were so economically bad for the Philippian believers that when Paul was taking a special collection for the church in Jerusalem, he planned to skip the Philippians and not even burden them by asking them to give. But they begged Paul for the privilege of participating in that offering. Can you imagine that? Through all of it, the Philippians gave offerings to Paul more freely and more frequently and more generously than the wealthy believers in cities like Corinth and Thessalonica. In Philippians 4, Paul is thanking them for the offering they sent him while he was under house arrest in Rome. And I want to use Paul's words here in Philippians 4 to say my own thank you to all of you for everything that you have given to get Harvest Time Church this far. And I want to encourage you with three quick thoughts this morning. The first thought is this. Every gift to Harvest Time Church is an offering to God. Every gift that you've given to us you have given to God. In Philippians 4.18, Paul says, your gift to me was an offering to God. Beloved, I want to tell you that every tithe check that you write to Harvest Time Church is a gift directly to God. Every missions offering that you share, every gift you bestow upon me and my family, upon our other pastors, upon the visiting ministers that come here is an offering to God. Ultimately, it is not men or their ministries or their missions that are the recipients of your gifts. Ultimately, it is God. And I especially want to thank you for your giving to our building projects. Every dollar that you have ever given into our building fund, you have given as an offering to God. I became the senior pastor of Harvest Time Church in 1999. We had six months to close on this piece of property. We put together our first mini capital campaign called Let's Take the Land, and in six months, you gave $500,000, which was the size of our entire annual budget in 1999. In 2000, we launched our first major capital campaign to help us build this building called Into the Field. And from 2000 to 2003, you gave $2 million. In 2005, we launched our second major capital campaign called Building Bridges, and you gave another $1 million. In 2007, we launched another mini campaign to erect our air dome outside called Let's Do the Dome, and you gave $350,000. In 2008, we launched our third major capital campaign to lay the groundwork for our phase two building called Accelerate 52. And in the midst of the worst recession since the 1930s, you still gave more than you have ever given before, $2.1 million. Over the last 14 years that I've been privileged to be your senior pastor, you have given more than $6 million to our building fund over and above your tithes and in addition to your missions giving. That's awesome, especially when you consider that over the first 15 years, the giving to the building fund was $1 million after 15 years. In fact, the total that you've given to Harvest Time Church over the last 14 years is $24 million. And all of that is an offering to God. Three quick encouraging thoughts. Every gift to Harvest Time Church is an offering to God. And second, nothing given to God is ever lost. Paul says, it's not about a gift for me, but about what might be credited to your account. Beloved, listen to me. The gifts that you have given to gospel ministers, the gifts that you have given to gospel ministries and gospel missions on earth are all spiritual seed that are deposited in your account in heaven. Paul said, I know the one whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to guard what I have deposited with him for that great and final day. Nothing given to God is ever lost. 
You know, your prayers are not lost. The Bible says that your prayers are collected in bowls in heaven. And even long after those prayers have left your lips, do you know those prayers are still working on behalf of the people that you've prayed for? They're still powerful. They're still effective. The, the answers to those prayers are still in the works. I had a praying grandmother. I thank God at the age of 83, she was stricken with arthritis. And uh, especially in her knees and her ankles, she was in terrible pain. But she would not go to bed until she first knelt down and prayed for every one of her 19 grandchildren. Do you know that she went home to be with the Lord several years ago, but her prayers are still in a bowl in heaven, and they're still working. Now, 18 out of 19 of her grandchildren are all serving Jesus Christ. There's only one left to go, and he doesn't have a chance. Nothing you give is ever lost. Your service, your sacrificial labors of love, your offerings of money, none of it is ever lost. Maybe you gave money to an earthly ministry and things didn't go the way you expected. Maybe you gave to a local church or to an evangelist or to a nationally known minister or, or to a missions project and things took a wrong turn. Maybe your gift wasn't appreciated. Maybe it wasn't used wisely as you wanted to see. Maybe it didn't bring the fruit in return that you believed that it would bring either to you or to that ministry. Can I tell you that that gift is not lost? It's in heaven. And I want to tell you, it's not lost on earth either because seeds of love, seeds of sacrificial giving sown out of a heart of faith and love for Jesus Christ, they have a way of working things in your life beyond what you could possibly imagine. Your giving has certainly made a difference to us and it has helped us to make a difference in the lives of many, many other people. Your giving enabled us to acquire this 10 and a half acre campus in 1999. We paid a million and a half dollars for it. A year later, another church in Greenwich called me and offered me six million dollars for this piece of property. You know, sometimes I wonder on my bad days how long I could have lived in Tahiti on six million dollars. <laughs> Your giving helped us to build this 25,000 square foot phase one building. Your giving helped us to finish and furnish the building and finish the grounds outside and launch new ministries. Your giving helped us to erect the air dome to house our youth group and all kinds of church programs. Your giving helped us buy the parsonage property just down the street. And I'm believing that eventually God is going to help us to buy the two properties between this property and the parsonage so that it makes one continuous tract of land for the church. But I want to talk specifically about Accelerate 52 for a moment this morning. The building that we're in this morning is one half of a building that we planned back in 1999. Originally, we designed a 650-seat sanctuary. This area was actually supposed to be Sunday school classrooms. This was supposed to be, the center aisle was supposed to be a center hall, and there were supposed to be classrooms on either side of it. We didn't plan a basement under the building because the zoning regulations wouldn't permit us to build that much usable space. So that was the building that we originally had approved by the town. And I remember, literally, I vividly remember the day that the construction estimate came back to me and I opened it up and I looked at the bottom line and I literally shrieked and I slid out of my chair and onto my knees. Pastor Faith jumped up and came running. She didn't know what on earth was going on. It was way more than we could possibly afford. This was more than we could afford. That was way more than we could afford. So I went to our lawyer's office and we stretched the plans out on a conference table and I remember when he took his green ruler and he laid it across the drawing of the building and he cut the building in half and he said phase one and phase two. 
And we lifted the roof on this part of the building and we made it into a sanctuary and we put a basement underneath with Sunday school classrooms. And I want to tell you the truth, beloved, honestly, for a period of a couple years, I struggled with the thought that perhaps I had failed God and perhaps I had failed all of you by not having enough faith to do that whole building in one pass. But in 2007, the Lord spoke to me three ways that it was time to get moving on phase two. I received a note in the mail from Pastor Tate, our founding pastor, and on the card, it was completely blank. When I opened it, there were just two words, and it just said, it's time. And then I was on the phone with one of my spiritual fathers, and I was talking about the building project. I didn't tell him about the note that I had received, but at the end of the phone call, he said to me, Glenn, he said, what I hear you saying in the spirit is, it's time. And then I had a dream, and in the middle of the night, the Lord spoke to me, and in a loud voice, he said, it's time. So I called our attorney and our architect, and we sat down for a meeting, and I said to them, it's time. And we dusted off the drawings from 1999 and we began to start on phase two. Now, stick with me. Because we put a building under this building, we believed that we were going to have to buy more land before we could build anything else. And we didn't know how that was going to happen because the land on either side of us is not for sale. It wasn't for sale then, it's not for sale now. But I knew we had heard from the Lord. As it turned out, a few days after we met, our attorney called me. And he said, Glenn, you are not going to believe this. Why do we as Christians always say that things are unbelievable, you know? That's, the Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. So we got to stop saying it's unbelievable. He said, you're not going to believe this. But he said, the town zoning regulations have changed in your favor. He said, basement space no longer counts against your maximum building area so long as it's mostly under the ground. So he said, you can add the second half to your building and you can put a basement under the entire thing and you don't have to buy any more land. So instead of being able to build 27,500 square feet, we were now able to buy 55, build 55,000 square feet. I don't know how much you know about zoning regulations, but that is nothing short of a miracle. But Tom went on. He said to me, at the time that the town passed the new zoning regulations, he said they also meant to pass tough new restrictions on how much of your property can be covered by buildings and parking lots, but he said they forgot to put it through at the same time. So just the moment that I called him and I said, it's time, there was a divine open window of opportunity. We went back to the drawing board and we changed the seating capacity of the sanctuary from 650 to 1,000. And underneath, we put a big fellowship hall and a cafe and a kitchen and a dozen new Sunday school classrooms. And we were able to add all the required parking spaces outdoors without buying any more land. In 2008, we launched Accelerate 52. How many of you have no idea what that means, Accelerate 52? It, it means nothing to you. Let me explain it to you. We took it from the book of Nehemiah. Accelerate stands for the miracle of acceleration that God's people received when they were rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. 52 stands for the 52 days that it took them to rebuild. Accelerate 52. I have to be truthful with you. After we bought this land and built this building with just 300 people, I thought phase two was going to be easy peasy with the seven or 800 people we had then. But the very week that we launched the Accelerate 52 capital campaign was the week that the bottom fell out of the stock market in New York. And you remember that time the real estate market fell apart, the job market fell apart. I'm going to say, in spite of all that, Accelerate 52 was still the largest capital campaign that we've had so far at harvest time. And here's what your giving has accomplished. 
First of all, we did get the zoning approvals. We got the new phase two building and all the parking lots approved while that divine window was still open. Your giving to Accelerate 52 paid for all of the fees, attorney fees, architect fees, landscape architect fees, civil engineer fees, environmental engineer fees, filing fees. I want you to know that that golden window of opportunity has closed. They did go on and pass the new lot coverage restrictions and they are so tough that what we have on this property right now already exceeds the new restrictions. But our zoning approvals are safe so long as we start within the time frame that they've given us. Your giving to Accelerate 52 has paid for a 100% complete set of architectural plans and site plans that are on file at Greenwich Town Hall. Our phase two building project is literally shovel ready. The second that we have the funds in hand and we're able to move forward, we can begin construction immediately. You're giving to Accelerate 52 paid for the two new parking lots that we installed a little bit over a year ago. Some of you remember uh, about two years ago, uh, before the start of third service every Sunday, there was a line of cars all the way around the driveway and out onto King Street. People couldn't get in. In fact, people would tell me, Pastor, we tried to get into church and when we saw we couldn't turn in the driveway, we just kept going. Well, we have our two new parking lots that have relieved that congestion. You're giving to Accelerate 52 paid for the new emergency backup generator. And would you believe we're running on that generator this morning? The uh, power went out uh, the first five minutes of the 10 o'clock service. We don't really know why, but the generator kicked in. So if that didn't happen, you would be sitting here with no air conditioning right now. So you ought to give thanks to Jesus that you gave to Accelerate 52. Accelerate 52 has also left us with a balance of over a half million dollars of seed money to help us out for the next leg of our journey. From the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you to everybody who gave to Accelerate 52. I think those five things are really amazing accomplishments in a difficult economic time, and they're a reason to celebrate. Today, we are officially retiring the Accelerate 52 capital campaign. And I want everyone who gave to feel proud of the contributions that you made. Some of us weren't able to meet the pledges that we made in 2008. Beloved, all I can say to you is that things in life might take us by surprise, but God is never surprised. We didn't foresee how badly the economy would crash. We didn't see how long it would take it to recover, but God isn't taken back by any of those things. And if you made a pledge to Accelerate 52 and you weren't able to meet it, I want you to consider your obligation fulfilled now. We've closed the books on the campaign. Let's celebrate what God has enabled us to do and let's commit the rest to his grace. Paul had a disease in his eyes and he wrote to the Galatians, he said, if it were possible, I know you would have plucked out your own eyes and you would have given them to me. And I know that's the heart of so many people here at Harvest Time. I know how many of you dream about being able to write the big check, the $1 million check or the half million dollar check or the $100,000 check or 50,000. I know if it were possible, I know you'd write the check. But you didn't allow what you couldn't do to stop you from doing what you could do. You did your best and now we trust God with the rest. Here's what I know, phase two is God's project. Beloved, I want to tell you that phase two is not my vision, it is God's vision. And it's an integral part of what God wants to do through harvest time here in Greenwich and in this region and all over the world. You know, going back to 1999, every dream that I have ever had about harvest time has been in the phase two building. There's only one dream that I ever had in this building, and it was a dream that the Lord gave me about a week before the Greenwich outpouring began. Every other dream I've ever had has been in the next building. That's how I know in my heart it's going to get done and that God is going to help us to start it soon. The board and I are praying that the Lord would help us to chart a course that will get us to groundbreaking next year in 2014. 
So I want you to scatter to the four winds for vacation. Make sure you mail in your tithe check before you head out of town. And then when you come back in September, we're going to focus on phase two together. Nothing given to God is ever lost. I want to tell you that your giving to harvest time is not about bricks and mortar. It never has been. It's about people. And you have helped us make a difference in the lives of many, many people. Real quick this morning, I wonder how many people here gave your heart to Jesus Christ or you recommitted your life to Jesus Christ here at Harvest Time Church. If that's you, I want you to stand up and I want you to remain standing. Would you stand and would you remain standing? Look at that. That's awesome right there. Stay standing if you would. How many people here this morning received water baptism here at Harvest Time Church? I want you to stand up or remain standing. If you already uh, stand up and remain standing, if you're, you're already standing, I want you to lift up your hand if you would. How many people here this morning received the baptism of the Holy Spirit here at Harvest Time Church? Stand up if you would and remain standing. If you're already standing, lift up your hand if you got filled with the Holy Spirit here. How many people received a physical healing here at Harvest Time Church? I want you to stand up if you received a physical healing or lift your hand if you're already standing. How many of you received a direct answer to prayer? You prayed and God did something. He answered your prayer and you knew it was decisive. I want you to stand up and I want you to remain standing. If you're already standing, I want you to lift your hand. How many of you came to Harvest Time Church like Lisa at a point in your life where you just really needed hope, you really needed help, and the Lord met you in a special way here at Harvest Time Church? Would you stand up or would you raise your hand if you're already standing? How many of you feel like you've grown closer to Jesus and you've grown in the Word and in the things of the Spirit since you've come to Harvest Time Church? I want you to stand up and remain standing. How many of you met great friends here at Harvest Time? Stand up. How many of you got married here at Harvest Time or your sons and daughters got married? Stand up. How many of you dedicated your children or your grandchildren here at Harvest Time? How many of you have been inspired or challenged in your faith or encouraged? How many of you just want to stand up because everybody else is standing? up and you're not standing up. <laughs> Come on, I want you to look around for a minute. I want you to look around for a minute and I want you to realize that your giving has made the life a difference in the lives of many, many people. Give the Lord a big hand, would you? All right, sit for one minute, and I promise you I'm going to finish as fast as I can. Three quick encouraging words. Every gift to Harvest Time Church is an offering to God. Nothing given to God is ever lost. And finally this, your giving to fully resource Harvest Time Church smells good to God. Your giving to fully resource our church smells good to God. Paul describes the Philippians giving in a few ways. He says, you gave to me again and again and again. And he says in verse 18, you gave abundantly. He said, I have received full payment. More than that, he said, I am amply supplied. The Philippians made sure that Paul was fully resourced. They didn't send just enough for him to scrape by. They sent Paul more than enough. Beloved, can I tell you, some Christians have this meager kind of mentality that ministry should have just enough to get by. Lord, we'll keep him poor, you keep him humble. But I have a dream that this church would be fully resourced. My dream is that our pastors and that all of our ministries would have everything that they need to always do an excellent job for the Lord Jesus Christ. My dream is to leave a fully resourced church for the next generation. My dream is to leave a state-of-the-art facility that is equipped with all the things that the coming generation needs to reach their own generation. My dream is to buy up every one of the adjoining properties between here and the parsonage so that our pastors and especially our future pastors don't have to worry about keeping a roof over their heads in a place that costs so much to live like Greenwich, Connecticut. Fully resourced 
is the way that God meant for his house to be. He said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there might be food in my house. Paul said, remember this, whoever sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously shall reap generously, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you always have everything you need to abound in every good work. Fully resourced is the way God meant it to be. Fully resourced ministries honor God. He gave his very best for his church. He didn't spare his own son. He offered him up for us freely. Jesus gave his life for his church. And when we make sure that our church is fully resourced, it shows God that we care about what he cares about most on earth. When we make sure that the church is fully resourced, we're acknowledging that this really is the most important work in the entire world. Fully resourced ministries please God because they reflect precisely how he provides for us. Pastor Jason, come rescue me. Fully resourced ministries please God because they reflect precisely how he provides for us for us. After Paul thanks the Philippians for their giving, he makes a prophetic declaration over them. I want you to notice what Paul says in Philippians 4.19. He doesn't say, I pray that God will bless you. He doesn't even say God is able to bless you. He speaks a declaration over them. He says, and my God shall supply all your needs. That is an awesome promise in itself, but it gets even better than that. He says, my God shall provide all your needs according to his glorious riches. That word according to in Greek is the word kata to. It means in proportion to. It means relative to. It means in ratio to. My God shall supply all your needs. Kata to. Not in proportion to the needs, but in proportion to his ability to provide. <laughs> Beloved, when you give offerings to God, when you make sure that his house is fully resourced, there is a declaration of blessing that rests over your life that God will provide your needs, not commensurate to the needs, but commensurate to his vast resources. Have you looked at his portfolio of assets lately? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he owns the hills. All the gold is his, all the silver is his. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. All wisdom belongs to him. All creativity belongs to him. The secrets of science and medicine and math and business belong to him. The mysteries of the universe belong to him. Some of us need help from heaven to see God through a new set of lenses. Sometimes People have a hard time believing God wants to do anything for them at all, let alone bless them with more than enough. But here's why it pleases God when we give to make sure that the work of his kingdom is fully resourced. It's because he himself is a cut to two kind of a God. He's a God of abundance. Look at the miracles of his provision. When his people walked out of slavery in Egypt, they walked out with all the gold and all the riches, all the wealth of Egypt. You know, that was their back due wages for building the pyramids. Some of us are going to have some back due wages coming to us. God is going to make the enemy that deprived us pay up with interest. When God's people needed meat, he buried them up to their necks in quail. What an amazing time we had last night with Canon Andrew White. What a beautiful man of the spirit. He pastors a spirit-filled church of 6,500 people in Baghdad, Iraq. He told us over the last few years, 
1,023 people in his congregation have been martyred for the sake of Jesus Christ. He baptized recently 13 people, and within a week, 11 of them were martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. But he told a wonderful story of God's provision. Right after the Iraq war ended, the Grand Ayatollah called him for a meeting. When he went, he said, Father Andrew, we have no meat for the people. And Andrew said to him, I, I have no meat to give to everybody. And the Ayatollah asked him, would you pray to your God? He went home and he said that night, just before he went to bed, he looked out the window and over the Tigris River, he said he saw this manifestation of the glory of God like he had never seen before. And he asked God about it and God led him to a scripture, a prophetic promise of his glory coming and resting over Babylon. And he almost forgot to pray about the meat, but almost as an afterthought, he said, God, he said, would you provide meat for the people? The next morning, he met an American who approached him and he said, Father Andrew, would you like to have some meat? And he asked him, how much do you have? And the American man said, I have 170 tons of meat in refrigerated tractor trailers that has to be given away. And God answered the prayers for meat. He's that kind of God. When his people needed bread, he scattered it across the entire desert floor. When his people needed water, he provided a rock that poured out a river in the desert and followed them everywhere they needed to go for 40 years. When a widow needed oil, he filled every empty jar in the city. When a wedding couple needed wine, he made hundreds of gallons of it. When a crowd needed lunch, he fed everyone until they were full and there were leftovers for days. When Peter needed faith he filled his boat so full of fish that the nets broke and the boat began to sink that's who he is he is a net breaking boat sinking kata two kind of a god three quick encouraging words every gift to harvest time is an offering to god nothing given to god is ever lost and your giving to fully resource Harvest Time Church smells good to God. Would you get on your feet and would you give Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place. Come on, let's give him a good praise. Thank you, Jesus. Let's give him a good praise. Thank you, Pastor Jason. We praise you, God. Come on, would you lift up your faces to heaven and lift up your hands real quick? Thank you, Jesus. Would you love on Jesus? Come on, just love on him. We love you, we love you, we love you. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Lift up your faces. Father, right now in Jesus' name, I pray by the wind of God, by the indescribable work of the Holy Spirit, God, I ask that we would be transformed through the renewing of our minds. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that orphan spirits would be broken off of your people today. Father, I pray every spirit of poverty, every spirit of lack, every spirit of stinginess that tends towards poverty, poverty, Lord, I pray it would be broken off of the people of God. Father, in Jesus' name, everything that has held us back, Lord God, from trusting you with our whole heart, I pray that it would just go in a mighty flood, in a mighty wave of the Holy Spirit. I pray, God, that you would release into our hearts, Lord, a joyful generosity, Lord God. Father, I thank you for these people that have given again and again. I thank you for these people that have given abundantly, God, so that the work of this house might be fully resourced. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would make all grace 
abound to them. God, so that they have everything they need. Lord, with the same measure that they've given in love and generosity. Lord, every offering we've ever taken for every special speaker, for every crusade on a foreign field. Lord, for Bible school students in countries all over the world. God, everything that we've given, Lord, to build these buildings. Lord, to fund the ministry of the pastors that work out of this house. God, I pray, Lord, that with the same measure that your people have given in generosity, that you would give back to them, that you would cause men to pour into their laps a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I pray, my God, that you would supply all the needs of your people. God, according not to the need, but according to your vast resources and your ability to provide. I pray blessing upon blessing. I pray that summertime would be a season of harvest, would be a season of reaping for the people of God. I pray that you'd open the windows of heaven, Lord, and pour out on your people, Lord. I pray for jobs and better jobs. I pray for promotions. I pray for increases. I pray for bonuses. I pray for sales and commissions. I pray that your people would have the plum assignments. God, I pray that they would have their pick of the very best accounts, Lord. Father, I pray that you'd bless every small business owner. Lord, I pray that you would sink their boats and break their nets, God, with such an abundance of blessings, Lord. I pray they would have their pick of the best jobs, of the best clients, Lord God, of the best possible uh, uh, scenarios, Lord God. Father, I bless everybody. If you're starting a business, lift up your hands right now. God, I bless these startups, Lord. I bless these startups. I speak three weeks of provision in a single day, and I speak a year's worth of provision in two and a half months. Lord, I pray that the katatu favor of God would rest upon your people, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, give the Lord a big hand in this place. Thank you, Lord. You, would you sit for one moment? There's one final act. I promise five minutes and five minutes and we're done. So it's a beautiful day outside, but you're going to go home happier if you stay for the next five minutes. Uh, Chris and Sandy, would you come? Would you bring your children and uh, come? Please welcome the Wilk family, our missionaries to Poland. Bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. I want to ask Lisa, would you come stand here and come stand. And Corey, would you come stand over here? Beloved, the, the final act of worship that we're going to do this morning is we're going to share an offering. And you know what? This is what I'm believing. This is the word from the whole. I didn't know when the day started out. I didn't know I was going to do this. And uh, But I, it's what I feel from the spirit. We're going to sow seed today. And this is the word that I just feel fully resourced, fully resourced, fully resourced. I'm praying that the seeds of love that we sow today are going to go to fully resource these ministering families on the mission field. I'm going to ask the ushers to come with offering envelopes. And uh, if you'd like to share in this offering today, they'll hand you an offering envelope. Uh, you can give by credit card or debit card, by cash or by check. Um, the ushers are going to bring offering plates in just a moment. We're going to come forward and we're going to share our offering. Please do take your time to fill out all the information completely on the offering envelope. And uh, while you're doing that, I want Chris to just bring us a greeting and uh, just tell us where they're in Poland and what God is doing. Thank you, Pastor Glenn. Um, for those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Chris Wilk. Sandy and I served here. Take that piece of paper. Sandy and I served here uh, back in the old days. Um, actually, <laughs> we were here back when Pastor Tate was still here. The last tie check that we wrote before we left Connecticut was for this building that we're standing in right now. Praise God. And um, God is faithful. I bring you guys greetings from the brethren in Poland, from the body of Christ there, number one. It's really big in Eastern Europe to bring greetings from other churches to other churches, so I bring you guys greetings from the body of Christ in Poland. I praise God to see what the Lord is doing here, you guys. What God is doing here is exactly what we're praying that God will do over there in Poland. And just to see how um, you guys are stepping out in Stanford, how you guys are stepping out in Norwalk with the campus in Norwalk, that's our heart. We live down in southern Poland in between Ukraine and Slovakia. We've been there since 2005. 
All of our kids have been in school there. Elizabeth, our oldest, is just coming back, the first one coming back to the States to go to college. And um, we're down 35, in southeastern Poland, 35 kilometers from where both my grandmother and grandfather were born and raised. And so uh, if you guys would just pray for the country of Poland, we're working on um, two church plants in the city that we live in called Tarnobjek. Um, and also in another city called Stashuv, as we head back, we're going to be starting up another church plant there. So you guys, I just pray that you would um, remember us in prayer, that God would pull down the strongholds there. People are in love with their religion and their traditions. Every household has a word of God, the Bible, but they don't know the passion of Christ. They don't know what it means to come into the house of God and worship God in spirit and truth. So we pray that you guys would just, uh, we want to thank you first of all for standing with us for so many years in prayer and support of our ministry. Man, just to see you guys back there serving the Lord like it was 15 years ago, man, it just blesses God's heart. And, um, and I just pray God's blessing upon you guys at Stanford and the Norwalk. That would just be the beginning of what God wants to do even into New York City and into New York. Amen. We love you guys and we thank you so much for standing with us. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right, ushers, would you bring, would you bring three offering baskets? And Corey, you step, take a couple steps. And Lisa, take a couple steps. Now listen, uh, your offering, not, we're going to, don't worry about which bucket is in front of who, all right? So we'll sort it out because God's going to fully resource. And this is, this is the blessing that we're going to exchange as you bring your offerings this morning. Um, I want you to bless these missionaries with the blessing fully resourced. And they're going to bless you back with the blessing fully resourced. So your families are going to be fully resourced so that God's work can be fully resourced. Amen. Do you believe that? So would you stand together with me? Now, Andrew White was with us and he was raised Pentecostal and he had a hankering from, for some old Pentecostal camp meeting songs. And so we sang them last night. We were here for an hour after service was supposed to end dancing in the aisles. So we're going to spin one of those for you. I'm going to bless you. And then as our benediction, come bring your offerings and listen, remember, bless them say I want you to say fully resourced to them and the missionaries are going to say fully resourced back to you all right we're going to be fully resourced for the glory of God now father bless your people as we go our own way let the cloud of your presence envelop us let your protection surround us let your provision accompany us let your providence lead us and your peace encircle us until we come together again and everyone said amen and amen God bless you while you come What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him.